dread to be a Christian. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, the book that we've been studying on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights from the book called the Book of Philippians, Paul reminds us that we need to rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. And that's because we are indeed Christians and we have so many things for which to rejoice. Uh, we need to rejoice this morning because we have such a good number in attendance and we're so very thankful for your presence. But more importantly, we need to rejoice because today uh, is the Lord's day. And what a very special opportunity it is uh, to be with the Lord's people. In just a moment, we'll gather around the Lord's table to remind us of the Lord's death. And we'll be, keep being reminded of that until the Lord returns. And we look forward to that day. I want to begin the lesson this morning with an old illustration. But yet, I think it's a very appropriate illustration for what we're going to be talking about this morning. A little boy goes out into his backyard and he has in his hand a uh, baseball bat and he has a ball and um, he's standing there and nobody else is in the backyard and he's just using his imagination and he says, I'm the greatest hitter in the world. And he throws the ball up in the air and he takes a swing at it and he misses. And he says, strike one. Picks the ball up Gus has got the bat in his hand, and he says, I'm the greatest hitter in the world. And he throws the ball up, and he takes the swing at it. Strike two. The boy looks down at the ball on the ground, and he picks it up. And he says, I'm the greatest hitter in the world. And he throws the ball in the work, up into the air, and he takes the swing at it. And he misses it again. Strike three. The ball there on the ground, the bat's in his hand, the boy thinks for a few moments, and he says, I'm the greatest pitcher in the world. <laughs> Sometimes in this life, we feel like we too maybe have struck out. Maybe at an attempt of trying to be the very best person we can be, uh, we realize that we have three strikes against us. But this morning I want to share with you something that Paul shares with us in the book of Philippians. And in our class on Sunday morning on Wednesday night, we've already discussed this section, but I thought it was something that the whole congregation needs to hear. But in this section, Paul points out to us that when we do feel like we have struck out, we don't need to justify it in some kind of way. Uh, we don't need to rename it in some type of way and call it something else. But instead this morning, Paul wants us to understand and appreciate the fact that we can have what we might call a do-over. Uh, we can have a second chance, if you will. I am so very thankful this morning that I serve the God of the second chance. Sometimes in life, we need a do-over. Sometimes when we feel like we're down and out, we need to be put back into the game again. Paul wants us to understand and appreciate the fact that when we do need a do-over, there is a possibility of having that done. I don't know about you, but uh, I know myself, there are times when I need to hit the reset button. I need to have a second chance, if you will. So this morning we're going to be looking at the passage that the Apostle Paul has for us. Jeff has already read for us from Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 14. The entire book of Philippians is a book of joy. Paul wants to emphasize how wonderful it is to be a Christian. Paul wants to emphasize how wonderful it is to be a member of the Lord's church. How in the Lord and have everything that goes along with it. As I said, the entire book is a book of joy. The only thing that's negative in the entire book is that Paul wants them to be weary of some people who were making laws where laws didn't exist and that would steal their joy from them. And so today we're going to be looking at a passage where Paul wants us to forget the shadows of the past. Now a few moments ago, when Jeff was reading that passage for us, he began with verse 12. And though verse 12 is not the main emphasis we want to look at today because we're dealing with the shadows of the past, 
But verse 12 is kind of the preamble or the prelogue to prologue to what Paul is going to be telling us. And basically in verse 12, Paul says, I'm not everything that I need to be. I've not reached the goals that I want to reach. I've not been the kind of person that I need to be. I'm not everything I need to be. In other words, Paul, in other words, Paul acknowledges that he has some shadows in his past that still follow him around. Shadows are something that whenever there is light shined upon us, if you will, even if it's just a weak light, a shadow uh, shows us a portion of ourselves that we can't see in the dark, if you will. And when there is light and light shining upon us, uh, that shadow follows us everywhere we go. Sometimes that shadow is behind us. Sometimes that shadow is to either side of us. Sometimes that shadow is in front of us, depending on the way that the light is hitting us. My point is, though, we have things in our life that we feel like follow us around. They're not there anymore because it's a shadow, but they seem to stick with us. Well, in our passage today, Paul is going to tell us how to deal with the shadows of the past. And the very first thing he tells us in verse 13 that we must, first of all, forgive the sins of the past. Let's open our Bibles and look at this passage in Philippians. And look at verse 13. He says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Forgetting those things which are behind behind. The Apostle Paul was somebody who understood what it meant to be a sinner. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13 starts talking about there some of the things of which he was guilty of. He referred to himself as being someone who was a blasphemer. He refers to himself as being someone who hurt other people. He uses the word injurious there in the King James, and that means actually inflicting pain upon, a someone, upon someone in a physical way. He was someone who blasphemed God, talking about from a spiritual, spiritual standpoint, he was not what he was supposed to be. And he talked about from an earthly standpoint, a physical standpoint, he was not what he was supposed to be. But then in verse 15 of 1 Timothy chapter 1, he gives us this beautiful, beautiful statement that I'm so thankful is in the Bible. He says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Yes, the Apostle Paul Paul, are you chief of anything? What's the main thing that you're known for? What's the chief thing that we, you think about when you think about yourself? What are you chief of? Paul, so Paul says, I'm the chief of sinners. But he's thinking about that because there's that shadow in the past, but he also wants us to dwell on the first part of what he says. He says, this is faithful. This is true. This will always be the case. And this is worthy of acceptation to all that Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners. To save sinners. Now as you go through the book of Acts, you discover how that uh, the Apostle Paul did some terrible, terrible things in his life. We can open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 8, and there we discover uh, a man being put to death, being stoned to death by an angry mob. A man by the name of Stephen, the very first Christian martyr, the very first man to die for his faith, and right there in charge of it all, giving his consent, probably the ringleader of the whole thing is the Apostle Paul. As you go throughout the book of Acts, you discover here is a man uh, that persecuted the church. Here's a man that put people into prison. Here is a man that did everything he could to try to destroy the Lord's church. In fact, there's even one passage there in uh, Acts chapter 9 and verse 1 where he says that he actually uses the word slaughter. I've often wondered what did he, why did he use 
Why did Paul, uh, Luke, talking about Paul, uses the word slaughter? Did Paul slaughter some people? That's what the text did, says. Did he cut people down? But yet through it all, the Apostle Paul is reminding us that that's the shadow of the past. I'm putting that behind me now. That I know that because of Jesus Christ and how that this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. We too this morning need to understand and appreciate the fact that we too are sinners. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 reminds us there is none righteous, no, not one. In Romans chapter uh, 3 and verse 23, the Apostle Paul again reminds us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not a single person in here, I don't care who you are, that has not sinned in their life. Perhaps will sin today and perhaps will sin tomorrow. The whole point that Paul wants us to understand and appreciate in this passage is in the context of what we're looking at that he, it's not about us, it's not about what we have done, it's about what Jesus Christ has done and therefore Paul has the admonition here we need to get rid of the shadows of the past. We need, as the text says, forgetting those things which are behind. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 reminds us if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 17, quoting God, if you will, says, I will remember your sins and iniquities no more. If you were to go out on the street today and ask the average person, how do you go to heaven? What do you go to do to go to heaven? Uh, how does one get into heaven? average person will say, well, and you try this sometime, just ask somebody. The average person will say, well, I guess you've got to be good enough. Well, there's two problems with that. First of all, you have to define what is good enough. And secondly, you got to understand and appreciate the fact that it's impossible to be good enough. That's the reason why Jesus Christ died on the cross. That's the reason why God sent His only begotten Son to this world. Because there's absolutely no positive possible way that we can be good enough. Once again, that's the point of this whole entire text. No matter what we can do, not anything that we can do can save ourselves. We're not everything that we need to be and we never will be everything that we need to be. In fact, there's a second thing that Paul wants us to understand as we look at verse 13. And it's simply this. We must forget the good that we have done for Christ. Earlier in the passage, if you remember when we talked about it last Sunday, he lists this long thing of everything that he had done for Jesus Christ. Everything that he had given up as far as being a religious person, if you will. But not only looking at what he says here in verses 4 through uh, uh, 8 in chapter 3, we can also, also look at the book of Acts and see some of the great and wonderful things the Apostle Paul did for Jesus Christ. He went on three missionary journeys. He perhaps, either because of his direct uh, contact or because of uh, people coming in contact with people that he converted, that perhaps millions were converted to Jesus Christ because of his uh, influence on the world. You can open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and beginning at verse 23, the Apostle Paul talks about everything that he has gone through for the cause of Jesus Christ. He had been beaten, he had been stoned, he had been robbed, he had been shipwrecked, he had been hungry, he had been naked, he had had so many bad things happen to him in his life because he was a Christian. And even as he writes the book of Philippians, he's in prison writing it. But as he says in verse 8, all these things that are gained to me, I count them but loss for Jesus Christ. You see, Paul understood that even with all the good that he does, living the Christian life, that is not reckoned toward his salvation. 
that doesn't get him anywhere as far as his salvation is concerned because, once again, that will do away with what Jesus Christ has done. In fact, Isaiah reminds us in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6, he says all of our righteousness is as filthy rags as far as God is concerned. Jesus said something curious one time as he was talking to his, to his disciples in Luke 9 and verse 62. He says, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looketh back, is fit for the kingdom. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, picture in your mind what he wants you to picture in his mind. Here is a man who is plowing a field. And he's looking forward because that's the work that needs to be done. And so he's plowing this field, and then he stops, and he turns around and look at, looks at the work that he has done. He looks at the furrow that he has plowed. He looks at what he has accomplished. Jesus says, you can't do that. You, you, you can't do that because that's not what being a part of the kingdom is about. It's not about the good that you have accomplished, though we have a goal in front of us. We're working to what God wants us to do. But yet at the same time, Jesus says, any man having put his hand to the plow and looked at back is fit for the kingdom. It's no wonder a little bit later in the same book in Luke chapter 17 and verse 10, uh, Jesus says uh, that when we have done everything that we have been told to do, we're still just simply unprofitable servants. Paul wants us to understand as we look at the shadows of the past, whether those shadows be bad shadows or those shadows be good shadows, we need to put those things into the past. Put them behind us. Forget about them. Literally the word for forget here is the word discard. You need to discard them. Because as Paul is going to tell us, they really have nothing to do with our salvation is because of what Jesus Christ has done. And so the very next thing he tells us is that we need to, as we deal with the shadows of the past, we must remember to reach forward to those things which are before. Paul says, as we forget those things that are part of the past, Regardless of what we may have done, here's something we can do that is proactive. Here's something that we need to be involved in. Instead of dwelling in the past, we need to be thinking about the future and looking forward to it. He says we need to forget those things which are behind. And now we need to reach forward. Reach forth into those things which are before. What are you talking about, Paul? Well, he tells us in the very next verse. He says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. A couple of interesting words here. There's the word mark. It says, I press toward the mark. Mark is, in the old Greek world, that was the finish line. You might think of it, even on tracks today, there's a white line that may be poured or painted uh, that's the finish line. Uh, there is sometimes in races, somebody will hold up a piece of ribbon and you have to run through that ribbon. He says, that's, that's the mark. There's something that we are reaching for. There's a goal in mind. And verse 14 also says, I press toward. The yeah, idea in the Greek is to pursue. Uh, the word literally is like an animal hunting its prey or a hunter hunting game animals. And it can be used to being someone who is stretching forth the finish line. Well, what is Paul wanting us to appreciate here? What is he uh, wanting us to understand? He's saying, as you forget the past and you're looking forward to the future, the main thing that you need to do is not give up. Don't Give up. Keep running. Keep pursuing. Look at that finish line. Look at the goal. Paul says in the text, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. God has called me to be saved. That is my goal. That's what I'm going to keep pressing toward. Sometimes I'm going to mess up. Sometimes I'm going to get knocked down. Sometimes I'm going to strike out. Paul says, I need to get up. I need to dust myself off. 
I need to pick up that ball and bat again if I need to. And I need to forget what has happened from that time forward. And I need to keep going on. I need to keep pursuing. I need to not give up. The text, he says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The prize there is the victory. Of course, talking about our eternal home in heaven. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 reminds us that we need to look to Jesus who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Now I love that particular passage because he points out a beginning and an end there. When he calls, the writer of Hebrews calls Jesus Christ the author of our eternal salvation, he is talking about the man who started it all. When a person writes a book, the person begins with the first word and he writes that book and he is the one who began that book. And that's what the writer wants us to think about in our minds. Who is the person that began the book that you are now writing as a Christian? That man is Jesus Christ. He's the one that started it all when you made the decision that because of your faith, you made the decision to repent of your sins, to confess His name, and be buried in the watery grave of baptism for the remission of your sins. That's where it all began. And we did that with the faith of knowing that if we obeyed those commands, that Jesus Christ was going to forgive us, that because of the blood that was shed on Calvary, our sins were going to be forgiven. And we understood that and appreciated that when we came out of the water. But the writer doesn't just stop there and say that Jesus Christ is the author of our faith. The finish, he also says He is the finisher of our faith. He is the one that's going to finish our faith or see us to completion. So now take that verse and take what Paul says. And Paul says we need to pursue. We need to look to that finish line. We need to go after that prize. And the writer of Hebrews says, as you do this, what are you looking at? What is the thing you're really looking at as you see that mark down there? The writer of Hebrews says, looking to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Last week, my uncle, my Uncle Claw, who was a preacher up near the Winston-Salem area, uh, had an article in his bulletin that I thought it was a good article, and, and it so happened as I was studying this, uh, uh, I saw where uh, my aunt posted this, and, and I thought I'd share a portion of it with you because I, I think it's something that is encouraging for us. Uh, the title of the article is, Our Accuser, by Claude Farr. He writes, the book of Job tells of Satan bringing accusations against Job. He said to the Lord, Doth Job fear God for naught? Job, Job 1 9. Then again, skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. Job 2 4. But Job is not the only one whom Satan accuses before God. In Revelation 12 10, Satan is referred to as the accuser of our brethren. Imagine that. Satan in the presence of God to accuse each of us. Do you think he might be able to dig up some dirt from our past? Maybe find a skeleton or two in the closet? The reality for all of us is all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 So where does that leave us? Can Satan really bring an accusation against Christians and make it stick? No, he says with emphasis. Listen to this reassuring, reassuring passage. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that content, condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is ever at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Romans 3, 33 through 34. If God is for us, who can be against us? I read a quote the other day that a preacher made that 
that kind of stuck with me this week, and I hope will make an impression upon you. In fact, in his particular congregation, they say this before every service. I know here we say, isn't it grand to be a Christian? Because this is part of that too. But this is what, how they begin their service every Sunday. He says, we are mighty men and women of valor because we are greater in the eyes of God than we are in our own eyes. And while our hearts may condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. The Apostle Paul, when he came to the end of his life, he understood the importance of keeping on, keeping on. He understood the importance of not giving up. He had written in Philippians that he was not everything that he needed to be. He realized that he had not reached the perfection that he wanted. And so he says, forgetting those things which are behind and looking forward to those things which are before, I press to the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, I'm not going to give up no matter what happens. I'm going to continue to have my faith in God. And so the last recorded words we have of Paul, and it's quite possibly he was going to be beheaded. He reminds us of 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 6. He says, For I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me a crown, and not only to me only, but unto all that love is appearing. Now notice what he has done there. He's saying, I have kept on keeping on. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. I have fought the good fight. All those phrases lead, lead us to believe that here was a man that didn't give up. He kept fighting. He kept running. He kept his faith in Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith. So it comes down to this morning. Where is your faith? Is your faith in yourself? Well, if your faith's in yourself, you're going to feel, fail miserably. Where is your faith in Jesus Christ? I would dare say there are some here this morning who have never become Christians because they feel like the things in their past are just so grievous. The things they have done is just so heinous. The things that they have committed as far as sin is concerned, as far as they are concerned, are unforgivable. And therefore they say to themselves, what is the use? Why even become a Christian? I am too far gone. Paul tells you, you need to forget those things of the past and you need to start looking toward the future. And that is a home in heaven. And you can have that future today putting your faith in Jesus Christ and humbly submitting yourselves to the watery grave of baptism. There are others today who uh, perhaps say, well, I've never will become a Christian because of the fact I know that once I become a Christian, I'm not going to be a very good Christian. I've seen other people. I see how good they are. And I see that I'll never be like that. So what's the point in trying I can't hold out. There's no way in the world that I'll be what God wants me to be. Therefore, there's just no point in even making an effort. Well, the Apostle Paul once again reminds us that he was a Christian. He understood that he was never everything that he needed to be. That's the whole point of the passage that we were reading today. He understood that he would never reach that point. But you know what he did? As a Christian, he forgot those things which are the past that shadow of the past, and he started reaching forward to the things which are before. He pressed toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, he never gave up. When he got knocked down by sin, he got back up again. When he looked at everything that he had done, and said, boy, I had a good day today. I, I, I did this, and I did this, and I didn't do this. He says, well, in the scheme of things, that's really not enough because I can't do enough. I can't be enough. I just can't do it. I still have to depend upon God and I've got to keep pressing on to my faith in Him. So if you're here today and you're not a Christian, you think that you can't be good enough to be a Christian, let me tell you right now, you can't be. 
I can't be good enough to be a Christian. Nobody in here can be good enough to be a Christian. Point is, we need to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and we need to try. We need to press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So if that's holding you back today, I hope that you'll respond and become a Christian before it's everlastingly too late. But there are the majority of us here today who are Christians. And like all Christians, some of our days are better than other days. Sin is sin, regardless if it may be something that you think is a minor thing or whether you might think it's a major thing. But one of the most wonderful things about being a Christian, what makes us different from the rest of the world, why someone would even make the decision to become a Christian, is that wonderful, beautiful, merciful, full of grace, the blood of Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7 reminds us if we walk in the light as He is in the light, once again, talking about what are we pursuing? What is our direction? If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. We're part of His church. And we have the blood of Jesus Christ which cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If there's anything that we can help you with today to help you get rid of that shadow of the past, we want you to respond as together we stand and sing.